Okay, thank you very much, Amrita, for that extremely generous introduction, and I'm not at all sure that I can live up to, to any of that, but thank you very much. I'd also like to say congratulations to Amrita, because she's really the person in the BPS who has led the drive for supporting women in pharmacology, and she's done an absolutely fantastic job. Now, when she asked me to give this talk, she said I could talk about absolutely anything. Um, I could be as outrageous as I liked. I didn't know at that time I was going to be videoed. Um, but <laughs> what I, I had to do was to say what it's been like for me as a woman in pharmacology. So this is going to be much more about what, what it's been like being a pharmacologist as opposed to talking about heavy science because you've had a day of science and you're probably all exhausted and you'd much rather relax a little bit. So this isn't going to be very taxing. So if we can get this to work. Yeah. So let's start off in my early days at school, and this is taken from the prospectus of my school as it is at the moment, so it didn't look like that in those many, many years ago when I was there. Um, but when I was at school, the things that were top of my agenda were very definitely music. Music was absolutely number one thing in my life, and had I had my choice, I would be a concert pianist now, but my talents weren't quite up to my aspirations, so I had to recognise that. I also loved literature and drama, um, I still am obsessed with boats, and anybody who knows me well will know that I'd much rather be on a, on a laser or on a catamaran than standing here doing a lecture. I love playing tennis, but I also had a sneaking interest in medicine, and once I started thinking about careers, medicine was actually what I planned to do until the upper sixths. And by that stage, I had a conditional place to read medicine, but we had an absolutely inspirational biology teacher who was a woman, she was very young, she was straight out of university, she'd done a master's degree, she'd done some research, and she told us about her research, and I just thought it was fantastic. So in the summer, um, I spent the time thinking, actually, I don't want to do medicine, what I want to do is science. So two weeks before I was due to go to medical school, I withdrew, and with a lot of scurrying around, I managed very quickly to find a place to read zoology. And off I went to the University of Sheffield. And here I landed on my feet entirely um, for many reasons. Firstly, I could do lots of music, so that was great. Um, but really, what and who inspired me? Well, the what was endocrinology. So you'll see I haven't progressed very far throughout my career because I'm still obsessed with endocrinology. The who? Well, there were two people, neither of whom any of you will probably know. The first was Ian Chester Jones, who was the head of department. He was an endocrinologist, as was everybody else in the department, and he was rather really the father of the adrenal cortex. And I was absolutely fascinated by the work he was doing in the development of the adrenal cortex and trying to understand the differences between the renin-angiotensin renin system and the control of allosterone secretion and the ACTH glucocorticoid axis, which at that time very little was known about. So Ian was absolutely inspirational. The other inspirational person was John Ebling, who was also an endocrinologist, but interested in the skin, but specifically interested in steroid actions. So you can see immediately how those two things, the adrenal cortex and steroid actions, had an absolutely huge influence on me at that very, very early stage. There was someone else I met in Sheffield as well that will be very familiar to many of you, one Rod Flower. Um, now, Rod and I were in the same year in Sheffield, and in fact, on week one, when we turned up to our very first practical class, our bays were next door to one another. Um, so I got to know Rod very well while we were in Sheffield. We were great friends, and he's been a great friend ever since. So after Sheffield, well actually after Sheffield, I decided I'd have enough of universities. I didn't want to see another university as long as I lived. So I went off to work at Glaxo. Um, but within about um, a month of being at Glaxo, I realized that actually I didn't enjoy the pharmaceutical industry that much. I was missing university life and wouldn't it be a good idea to go and do a PhD. So I searched around for a bit for something interesting and Quite quickly, I was lucky enough to be offered a place at the Royal Free Hospital School of Medicine um, in the pharmacology department, and that's where I did my PhD. The Royal Free had a very interesting history in that originally it was a medical school for women. 
Um, but by the time I got there, um, the ratio of male to female uh, medical students was about 50-50. But nonetheless, it did have quite a, a female-dominated staff. And of the four preclinical departments, three of them were headed by women, including the Department of Pharmacology. So I found myself in early 1972 doing a PhD in the Department of Pharmacology, working with Bob Hodges, who was the second professor of the department, on mechanisms controlling the secretion of ACTH. Now, the head of department was a, a very famous endocrinology, um, pharmacologist called Eleanor Zymes, who those of you who know your history of pharmacology will know that she was one of the lead players in the discovery of hexamethonian and the other methonian compounds. And the department was very small, as departments were in those days. I think there were only about half a dozen academics. And there was very definitely a them and us. There was her group doing all the methonian compound work, and there was our group down the end of the corridor, sort of hidden and not really seen, because endocrinology wasn't quite respectable within pharmacology. So it was a slightly strange environment, but it was tremendous fun, and we had a lot of laughs. Um, so I started off doing my PhD on the hypothalamo-pituitary-adrenal-cortal axis. At that stage, we actually didn't know very much about it, amazingly. We knew that the pituitary controlled the adrenal by producing ACTH, which caused steroidogenesis. We knew the hypothalamus produced neurohormones, which controlled the release of ACTH. But we didn't know what those neurohormones were. We had no idea. Um, we knew the axis had a circadian rhythm, and we knew that it was very important in helping the body respond to and live with stress. We also thought at that stage that there was a feedback mechanism by which the glucocorticoids could self-regulate their own secretion, but even that wasn't very well documented. Now, when I came on the scene, it had just become possible to measure AC resting levels of ACTH in the circulation of humans. Somebody developed a very sophisticated bioassay. So my job was to see if we could develop that bioassay into one that we could use in rats and other rodents. So I spent my PhD measuring ACTH in the circulation and doing all sorts of manipulations with glucocorticoid levels to try and understand the relationships between glucocorticoids and ACTH. And we were able to show some, some quite interesting data, and inevitably we showed that the whole thing is much more complicated than a simple negative feedback loop. So that was my PhD. Now, of course, while I was doing my PhD, there were many, many people willing to give me lots of advice about my career and what I should be doing. And one very good bit of advice I had extremely early on was to join the BPS and also to join the Society for Endocrinology which I'm pleased to say I did, and both societies have given me enormous pleasure. I've met many, many wonderful friends, and it's been a fantastic forum for networking um, and learning about science, and I'd, I'd say that for, for both of them. My prof was very keen that young scientists got out and talked in front of their um, peers and also senior staff, so very frequently he used to tell me, you need to get your face in front of the buggers. We used to have lots of um, good-natured arguments at our end of the department, and quite frequently he used to say to me, why don't you go home and do the bloody ironing? And I used to tell him he was a theoretical socialist, and it was all very good-natured and good fun. In those days, the world of PC-ness didn't exist, and you could have very, very good-natured banter without anybody getting terribly uptight about it. So I still have a joke with him. He's 87 now, and we still joke about the bloody ironing. So I think, I think that was nice. So I wasn't offended. Now, an interesting one here that came from the head of department. When I finished my PhD, I was offered a lectureship in a clinical department um, at another university. And the head of department, who'd never really taken much interest in me until then, came along and said to me, this will damage your career. If you're a non-clinical scientist working in a clinical department, this would be a very, very bad move. Don't do it. I will find some money um, to support you. And amazingly, she did. Now, whether that was a right or wrong decision, I don't know, but certainly staying at the Royal Free for a postdoc was, was a great opportunity, and it's one that I don't regret. And we'll come back to clinical departments in a bit. Another bit of advice I had from the head of department the day before I got married 
was that marriage is the most important step you will take. Um, I would agree with her. Um, I'm extraordinarily lucky in that I married a fantastic person about a week after I got my PhD, and I'm very lucky that I'm still married. So I would say it is the most important thing you do. I thought it was rather good coming from her because she was on about her fourth husband by then. <laughs> um, and there was one famous occasion when that particular husband was something terribly important in the Greek embassy, and he'd been invited to dinner with the Queen. Um, but she couldn't go because she was doing an experiment and she rang up and said, I can't leave my cat, I'm doing an experiment and didn't go to dinner at the palace. So. Now, my prof's wife, Jean, on the day before my marriage as well, told me never to learn to start, to start a lawnmower and I faithfully followed that advice. Um, there are a lot of things around the house that I am totally incapable of doing, and starting a lawnmower is one of them. So that's great advice to anybody thinking of getting married. Um, husbands are much better at that. And my mother-in-law told me I should get a good woman. And by that, of course, she meant I should get someone to clean the house. So I did do that. Um, so, in fact, I've never done the bloody ironing, I'm pleased to say, only in emergencies, and I'm very bad at ironing. So that was the sort of advice I had when I moved into my postdoc years at the Royal Free. So what did I do in my postdoc? Well, I was very interested in trying to understand what regulated the pituitary, like many other people. And we needed a way of trying to measure what was coming out of the hypothalamus, and also measuring um, its activity. So we set up a sort of typical pharmacologist bioassay system. We had sections of adrenal that we could put ACTH onto the sections. That caused a color change in the adrenal cortex, which we could measure by quantitative microscopy. So very early on, back in the early 70s, we were actually doing um, quantitative image analysis. But we could use that, coupled with the pituitary, we could incubate the pituitary, that, of course, released um, ACTH into the medium, so we could put the ACTH onto the sections, and, of course, we could stimulate the pituitary with all sorts of putative CRFs, and that's what we did. And we also were interested, we got very interested in vasopressin as a potential CRF at that time. And we had lots of nice data from in vitro models. We wanted to move into an in vivo model. And very conveniently, long before we had to worry about knocking genes out, nature had done it for us. And there's a strain of rat called the Brattleboro rat, um, which has a mutation in the vasopressin gene, so it can't process the protein properly, so it doesn't have any vasopressin. So we decided we'd get some of these rats. The only place in the country that had them was the University of Sheffield. So Bob Hodges, our technician, Jackie and I, decided we would go on a day trip to get some rats. This was in the summer of 76, which those of you who were around then will remember that that was one of the hottest summers ever known. I think global warming must have been well underway by then. Now, Bob was obsessed with cars, and he'd seen an advert in his local paper saying that the Citroën garage was allowing people to hire a car for the day to see if they liked it, and obviously with the hope that they might buy some. So Bob said, right, I'll hire this Citroen car and off we'll all go to Sheffield. So off we went, and we went to Sheffield and we got these rats and we thought, hmm, lovely day, sunshine, let's go to the pub. So off to the pub we went, had a nice drink, non-alcoholic, I hasten to say. Back to the car, now, better just check, the rats are okay because they were all in the boot of the car. And we opened the boot of the car and I can still see it to these, this day. These rats pee their body weight every day. They'd escaped from their cages, and they were charging around the boot of this car. So quite what the garage owner said when he got the car back that evening, I don't know, because I left Bob at the Royal Free while I tended to the rats and made sure they were okay. But those were good fun days, and we did produce some quite interesting evidence that vasopressin is indeed very important in regulating ACTH secretion, but it's not the be-all and end-all of it. And of course, we now know there's a CRH as well. We were also able to use our pituitary system to look at other things on pituitary function and in particular to identify the pituitary as a very important site of steroid feedback. We also became interested in trying to understand more about CRHs. So we extended our bioassay system to the hypothalamus 
which we could also incubate in vitro. And that, of course, released CRFs, which we could put on the pituitary to release ACTH, and then put the ACTH onto the adrenal to measure the ACTH activity. So you can imagine how laborious all of this was. But that technique proved to be very useful, and we were able to do quite a lot trying to understand these neural mechanisms which regulated ACTH secretion. So using that complex bioassay system, together with lots of different in vivo techniques, we were able to identify quite a lot of the neurotransmitter systems which regulate CRH secretion, particularly in conditions of stress. And of course, we were also able to identify the hypothalamus as another locus of steroid action and indeed other sites of the brain, in particular the hippocampus. Now all of that covers actually many years' work, and by that time the Royal Free had moved away from its rather dowdy accommodation in King's Cross up to rather glamorous Hampstead, and I spent ten years up there. And during that time I was appointed to an academic post. Like all good academics, I had to raise grant money and establish my own group. <coughs> I'd always been interested in teaching because when I did my PhD, teaching was part of the job. All PhD students had to demonstrate in practical classes. All young postdocs had to do tutorials, so it was just part of life. Um, and I became very interested in teaching, and I continued to be interested in teaching while I was at the Free. I also became much, much more involved in, in BPS and did many more things with that, which was all great fun. Moving on 10 years to 87, um, Alan Cuthbert said to me early in 87, there's a chair coming up at Charing Cross, you ought to apply for it. And I thought, I can't possibly do that. Um, but after a bit of coercion, I did, and much to my absolute amazement, I was appointed. So by 18, 1987, I was beginning to learn about running a department. Um, Charing Cross was not too dissimilar to the Royal Free in many ways. I mean, it looks like it, but it was also quite similar in character. So I didn't feel too out of place. That was until I went along to my first committee meeting called the Professoriat. And we had a delightful professor of medicine at the Royal Free called Abe Guz, who I'm sure many of you will know. He was an absolutely great guy. And he'd obviously decided this, this young professor coming in, he had to look after her. So he took me off to the first Professoriat meeting and in I went with him, and I looked around the room and I thought, oh my God, everybody in here is at least 20 years older than me, and they're all men as well. So I just sort of sat down and we got on with it, and I was still feeling quite tense, and then this little note from Abe came along, and it said on it, X will say this, B will say that, and C will say that. And lo and behold, this came out absolutely in the pattern he predicted. So I realised that none of these things were actually intimidating at all. They were all a bit of a laugh. And I'm afraid I've always thought that about committee meetings ever since. You can always predict how people are going to behave. Now, another great joy of running a department was, of course, you have a free reign. You can do what you like within limits. And um, I was quite keen at that stage that the medics, who were very rightly medically focused, should also have some opportunity in their BSc year to experience some industrial connections and to learn a little bit about drug development from the pharm pharmaceutical perspective. And I was very, very lucky that my old friend Richard Green, who will be very familiar to a lot of you, was at that time um, running the AstraZen Astra, as it was then, Neuroscience Center, actually located precisely where I did my PhD in the old Royal Free Building. Talk about coincidences. But Richard was very, very keen that his unit should be involved in teaching. So we developed a great partnership where he did all the work and I did very little of it. And our students used to go to AstraZeneca, or at least some of them did, to do their projects. And quite a few of Richard's staff used to come over to the Royal Free to contribute to our tutorials. So it was a very nice arrangement that we had going there. It was really great. I also quite soon found I had broader responsibilities, and I'm not sure whether this was cause and effect, but within a couple of years of my going to, the, um, to Charing Cross, um, the heads of the other preclinical pre departments all moved on to other jobs. So I'd gone from being the new girl on the block very quickly to being the old hag around the place who sort of knew what was happening. So I found myself, very alarmingly, 
preclinical dean. So I was actually then responsible for the, the whole of the preclinical school, which brought some quite interesting responsibilities and opportunities to do a lot of things outside of the college, which, which I enjoyed very much. So there were many more external activities. But of course, really importantly, I needed still and I wanted still to develop my research program. And by that time, I'd moved away from sort of classical neurotransmitters and CRH control, and I'd become very interested in the relationship between the host defense system and the neuroendocrine system. And this, of course, gave me an absolutely wonderful opportunity to make contact with Rod again, and he and I started a joint program of research, which in fact is still active to this day. So that's been a huge pleasure. I also managed to recruit some fantastic people one of whom is sitting over there, Pat. Um, and I think we had enormous fun during those days. We really did. They were a great group. We had lots of laughs, but we also did a lot of research as well. So that was a huge pleasure. And I've always been lucky in that I've recruited really, really nice people into my team. And we've always had a wonderful atmosphere, which I think is super. So we carried on working on this HPA axis, but this time focusing on inflammatory mediators. And we were able to learn a lot about how the HPA axis responds to inflammatory stress, looking at the roles of cytokines, eicosanoids, nitric oxide, and histamine in particular, and understanding the different sites in which they acted. We were also very interested in the idea that glucocorticoids um, negatively regulate the host defense system, which was something 20 years ago, people were quite suspicious of. They always thought the anti-inflammatory actions of glucocorticoids were pharmacological, nothing to do with real physiology, because you have to give such huge doses to get anti-inflammatory activity. And it wasn't until really the late 1980s, early 1990s, that people really began to appreciate that glucocorticoids physiologically have a very, very important role in regulating the host defense system. We were also very interested in trying to understand the mechanisms by which glucocorticoids fed back onto the pituitary and the hypothalamus and other parts of the brain, and really getting into the molecular biology of it and trying to understand the molecular and cellular mechanisms. And particularly, and perhaps not surprisingly, since we were working with Rod, understanding the role of an exin-1, and we've done a lot of work on that. And this just shows you one of the early experiments that I think... Um, Helen Loxley and Amanda did, where they were looking, trying to understand whether a nexin was involved in steroid feedback. And what they were doing here, if you look at the open columns, these are control animals. If you give them an inflammatory stress, in this case IL-1 beta, you can see you increase plasma ACTH levels. If you just give them a dose of corticosterone, not much happens. But if you pre-treat them with corticosterone and then give them IL-1, then you don't get the normal rise in ACTH secretion. So that's a nice model of steroids exerting acute effects. If you pretreat the animals with an antibody against an exin, then you can see IL-1 still works very well, but interestingly, corticosterone doesn't. So that was one of the very early experiments that we did, which showed that an exin had an important role in mediating glucocorticoid action. Well, that was all well and good, and that was all great fun, but there were other threats and opportunities around the place. And one thing that I perceived as an enormous threat in the early 1990s was that document that Jeff Aronson was talking about earlier this afternoon, Tomorrow's Doctors. Um, and when I read that, I was frankly shocked to see that pharmacology was scarcely mentioned. I was not only shocked, I was absolutely enraged by it. And at that time, medical schools were under a lot of pressure to completely rejig the curriculum. Disciplines were out, everything was integrated, lectures were out, it was all let's turn everything upside down. And while I'm all for change, I think change can be very good, I was desperately worried about pharmacology. So this was at the time when another threat, or in my case I thought it was an opportunity, but a lot of people thought it was a threat, Imperial College came on the scene. And not only were we talking in London about lots of changes to the curriculum, which were national changes, there was also pressure from government after the Tomlinson report to merge the medical schools in London into four big medical schools. And of course, that's exactly what happened. So at the time Tomorrow's Doctors came out, we in Charing Cross 
were talking with Imperial College about the possibility of becoming part of Imperial College with St. Mary's, with the Hammersmith, with um, NHLI. And so not only were we thinking about merging, we were thinking about a new curriculum. And at that stage, Simon, Tom and I, and Simon is, was from St. Mary's, now of course Imperial, um, decided that we were going to fight this. And we really did put up an enormous battle to keep pharmacology alive and kicking in the curriculum. And I, would, I wouldn't say we succeeded, but we didn't fail either. We got a very, very clear course of pharmacology, labelled pharmacology, within the basic medical curriculum. And I'm pleased to say that it has now grown very substantially. There's much more pharmacology in it as well. But we never allowed it to die. So I was quite pleased with that. So we did, of course, go on and merge with Imperial College. And as I said, I saw that as an enormous opportunity. Lots of people saw it as a huge threat, but I thought it was a fantastic opportunity. Um, so there's good old Imperial. So what was it like? Well, Imperial, of course, is very research-driven, and that was what excited me about the merger. I thought there were really enormous opportunities for research. And one of the things that attracted me was part of this merger was merging with what was then the Royal Postgraduate Medical School, the Hammersmith. And very soon after we merged, I managed to twist the arm of Chris Edwards, who was the principal of the faculty, to allow me to move my research lab from Charing Cross to the Hammersmith. And that was, for me personally, and I think my group, an absolutely fantastic move. As a sort of pharmacologist stroke endocrinologist, um, I soon became very interested in the work of Steve Bloom, who is probably one of the world's leading endocrinologists who was based at the, Ham at the Hammersmith, or who is based at the Hammersmith. And I was very, very lucky in having my lab next door to his. And that was really a huge opportunity, and one, I think, which enabled us to do an awful lot that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So I'm eternally grateful to Steve. He's been a great friend and support. I also recruited some more very, very good people. Um, I was, again, very lucky, and you will know, I'm sure, Egle Salito, Chris John, and Felicity Gavin, so that also was, was very, very nice. Now, another thing which appealed to me about Imperial was, of course, the multi-faculty environment. And having been in a small medical school all my life, the opportunity to be somewhere where there were engineers, natural sciences, a business school, to me was hugely exciting. But finding a way into it is actually quite difficult, because if you're out in one of the outlying campuses, there aren't that number of opportunities to go to South Kensington to meet all those interesting people who do something very different. But I was again, luck was with me as it often has been in my career, I was very lucky to be appointed um, non-clinical dean for medicine about a couple of years after we merged. And deans in Imperial are, are strange species. They don't have any executive role. They have, they're sometimes called the conscience of the college. But it means that you get involved in Many things like promotions, um, appointments, all of those sorts of things. It was a real opportunity to get to know loads of people across the college and understand how the college works. So for anybody like me who likes networking connections, that was an absolutely huge opportunity. I met loads of people and it was really huge fun. Um, I was also incredibly privileged to be president of the BPS and that again was fascinating time um, and a great privilege to be working with so many wonderful people. It was in the time when it was the run-up to the 75th anniversary and we of course were in the planning stage and the one thing we really wanted to try and achieve with the 75th and Ray was integral to this because he chaired the um, committee that was responsible for external affairs at, at the time was to try and promote pharmacology in the public domain much much more. And we were working very hard, making the foundation for what Jeff was talking about this afternoon, of talking about the problems there were, or at least that we perceived, in the medical schools about the teaching of pharmacology and basic pharmacology, and also explaining to the general public how important pharmacology is, what it is, and why it really matters. So that, again, was, was a time of enormous opportunity to do lots of interesting things outside of, of the day job, which... I also appreciate it very much. Well, of course, I was still involved in, in other things, like Welcome Trust, etc. But at that stage, I, after I stopped being a dean, I was asked to run a division. And 
The divisions in Imperial were very, very different from the sort of department I'd, I'd run before because divisions in Imperial within the medical school were vertically integrated. So all that good advice I had about never working in a clinical department, of course, immediately fell apart because I was head of neuroscience and mental health and I was working with neurologists, psychiatrists and basic scientists. And that, again, was a very, very stimulating experience and it was, I think, a wonderful opportunity for doing truly translational research and really getting the scientists and the clinicians to work together to understand what each other are doing and how they work. So that, again, was a huge opportunity and lucky for me. Now, also very fortunate for me at that time was that the BPS had been really instrumental in working with the pharmaceutical industry to highlight the concerns about the lack of skills in the UK and beyond in in vivo pharmacology. And this was really another indirect consequence of the Tomorrow's Doctors document um, in that pharmacology departments and such had begun to disappear in the UK. Pharmacology is a discipline was beginning to disappear in the, in the UK. And so the really, really core skills were beginning to disappear. And that, of course, was exacerbated by the molecular biology era because you were only really of any value if you could do a Western blot. I also thought it was fascinating that pharmacologists bought into that because one of the things of our trade has been quantification. And the thing I remember most from my early pharmacology training is having to understand quantification of drug action and yet we all bought into something that was totally non-quantitative. You did your blot and it was either there or it wasn't there. Or there were some very spurious attempts at quantification that I think any real harm, hard pharmacologist would have a shock at. But back to the in vivo stuff, as I said, there was this real dearth of skills, and I think there still is. And the BPS worked with pharma and with the research councils to raise a big tranche of money to support in vivo pharmacology. And it funded four centres, and Imperial was very lucky to be one of those four centres. So we set up what is now the Centre for Integrative Mammalian Physiology, and it's lost the pharmacology, I don't know what's happened to that, or the SIMP. So that was wonderful. And here are my partners in crime with that, um, who were with, with me responsible for writing the grant application. And Nick Wells, who's not a pharmacologist, he's a vet, but he's really played a big part in, in leading the development of our MRES program. Maria, I'm sure, will be very familiar to many of you. And that's just a picture of the symposium we had last year, so you can see there's some science going on, but there's also quite a lot of networking going on as well. So, in all of that, what about teaching? Had I forgotten about teaching? Well, no, I hadn't. Um, to the contrary, I was still concerned about teaching, and we had then been talking about developing a BSc in pharmacology, and I'm very pleased to say that that is now on the road, and we've got our first cohort of students this year. Um, I also recruited another pharmacologist who's sitting there, and he was my last recruit um, into the Division of Neuroscience and Mental Health, and that was, to me, a great coup to get Ray to come to um, Imperial. But I was, as I said, very interested in teaching, and one day the phone rang, and it was the deputy rector, and he said, could he have a chat with me? And I thought, ooh, you know, I wonder what on earth's gone wrong in the division now. So I trotted over to South Ken to have a chat with him, and much to my amazement, he asked me if I'd be interested in becoming pro-rector for education for the college. And I sort of thought about it, and I thought about my real interest in education and my concerns about some of the things which are happening, particularly in schools at the moment with education. And I thought this would be a really very exciting um, opportunity, so I said, yes, please, not really knowing what I was letting myself in for. Um, but it has been a wonderful experience. It's a job I absolutely love. I do still have a very limited interest in research, and some of my team are over there, and they'll tell you that they don't see me very often. Um, and I do miss that a lot, but I really enjoy what I'm doing. But talk about going full circle. What else am I responsible for? Well, under my remit comes music. And never in my life did I think that me, who really hasn't done much practically in music, would actually be responsible for Imperials and not direct the department reports to me. Um, so I have huge opportunities. It must be the only job in the world where going to lunchtime concerts is actually part of your job. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, and 
after 40 years of not playing the piano, I'm even now having piano lessons again, so it's absolutely wonderful. And some of my fundraising now isn't science related, and the last lot of fundraising I did was actually with the Coldstream Guards, um, who are very interested in working with us because I'm sure they would like to recruit our students, but they're very interested in promoting music, of course. And so we had an event earlier in this year, a fundraising event, to raise money for our students to have music scholarships so that they can have lessons at the Royal College of Music, which backs on to Imperial College. And this is just a picture of the night that they handed the cheque over to me. So it's the first time I've ever had um, a grant for something which is not for science. And it really did give me enormous pleasure. And this young gentleman here, David, who is a first-year medical student, is also a fantastically talented violinist, and he's the one who's got the scholarship. So that was absolutely wonderful. And it's actually one of the most... It's one of the things I've enjoyed most, actually. I think it's just such a fantastic privilege to be in a position where we can help these young people not only develop their science and their medicine, but also develop their broader skills and keep their interests going. So really, just to end, I'd like to say thank you to all my wonderful friends and colleagues because without all of you, it wouldn't have been any career at all. But I've just had such fun all the way through. So thank you very much. <laughs>